introduction of guests. It is now time for a member statement. The member from Nipissing. Thank you, uh, Speaker. I ask the members here, did you brush your teeth today? Did you take any prescription pills? Are you wearing a rayon shirt or blouse? You may ask, what do these have in common, Speaker? And I can tell you, all of those products contain wood pulp. Does your car have an airbag? If so, the detonator has wood fiber. Was there shredded cheese on your lunch? If so, the cellulose gum that stops them from sticking, well, that's wood pulp. Are there paper clips in your desk? Wood fiber stops those from rusting. Did you get flowers in a cellophane wrap or candy in the crinkly package? That's all wood pulp, cellulose from wood chips. Speaker, tomorrow, members at the Justice Committee will be asked to stand up for the forestry sector and for Northern Ontario. There are amendments to Bill 52 to ensure the legislation isn't manipulated to the detriment of the North. The bill is meant to protect the voices of the people who are unable to protect themselves, not the multi-million dollar anti-forestry special interest groups. I urge the government to support the amendments and stand up for the people of Northern Ontario. Thank you. For the member statement, the member from London Fanshawe. Speaker, I'd like to talk about the ongoing concerns about layoff notices at Community Living Elgin in the London area. My colleague, the member from Hamilton Mountain, has written a letter to the Minister of Community and Social Services about the seriousness of these layoff notices and their impact in our region. This government has already slashed programming and services for some of our province's most vulnerable people, and nonprofits and transfer payment agencies like Community Living are left picking up the slack. And to, further injure, and to add further injury, the government has not supported pay equity obligations with funding that allows these organizations to make ends meet. The government has promised to reduce wait lists for services like those offered by Community Living Algon, and yet we are seeing unprecedented workforce cuts and more damage to an already precarious system. And this says nothing of the ripple effect of the impact of the resultant job losses. Southwestern Ontario is suffering from serious unemployment and continues time and time again to be the victim of this government's inability to manage the economy. But the minister has said that she and her ministry are monitoring this situation at Community Living Elgin extremely closely. We would be very interested to know, to know what this extremely closely monitoring has revealed. The minister also stated on September 17th in a response to a question that the review would take a number of weeks. It has been nearly a month, and I would like to know when can we expect to see the results of this review. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Further member statements? The member from Durham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Another great festival in downtown Bowmanville. Saturday, October 17, in hist is historic downtown Bowmanville Bill's Opera Fest. This is the 25th year for this incredible popular event, and if you know Durham, you know the importance of apples to our local agricultural sector and economy. For, for the day, four blocks in the downtown of Bowmanville will be closed to vehicular, vehicular traffic to become an opera-related showcase. My plan is to get there early. There's always a lineup for fresh, hot opera fritters, but it's always worth the wait. I know how hard our local opera producers have worked to ensure the best crop possible under some tough spring conditions this year. I also know that historical downtown Bowmansville, BIA, put, put in, puts in a huge effort to ensure events like this is a go-ahead and a wonderful success. I would like to thank them for all they do in advance of this year's event, which I'm sure, as always, will be fantastic. So if you don't have plans for October 17th, I would invite you to join us in Bowmansville. It's well worth the trip. I'll sh even share some of my fritters with you. So please come and join us on October 17. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Here, here. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Sim uh, York Simcoe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, today I rise to speak about the province-wide opposition to the Premier's fire sale of Hydro One, and specifically to the overwhelming opposition in my own riding of York Simcoe. Mr. Speaker, this summer, the Simcoe County Council supported a resolution from the Western Ontario Wardens Caucus, which cautioned that, and I quote, privatization partial, partial or whole of electricity has led to higher rates 
and less control. In their resolution, they both called on the provincial government to stop the sale of any part of Hydro One and maintain Hydro One as a wholly public asset for the benefit of all Ontarians, as well respect the autonomy and local decision-making powers of local distribution companies by not forcing these companies into mergers or sales. They argued that the government has no mandate to sell any part of Hydro One, and I agree. Mr. Speaker, they are worried that Hydro One will no longer be subject to scrutiny by the Auditor General, the Ombudsman, or the Integrity Commissioner. Further, they will no longer have to respond to freedom of information requests. Voters know that this government is ignoring their voices on this matter and are rallying to other levels of government in the hopes of being heard. This resolution must sound familiar to the Premier, as it was sent to her in a letter from the County of Simcoe on August the 11th. Thank you. It may also sound f familiar to the Minister Thank of you. Energy and the Minister of Finance. Thank you. Further member statements? The member from Temiskimi Cochran. Thank you, Speaker. On Wednesday evening, September 23rd, Mr. Sam Bryant was doing something we commonly do in Northern Ontario. He was out bird hunting. Barge hunting, just outside of Latchford, something we, a lot of us do. But the hunter became the hunted when a fairly large black bear came out on the trail. Sam did what we are told to do and try to stand off the bear, but the bear wasn't in the mood for doing what he was supposed to do. So Sam did what every person I think in this house would do when the bear started coming, Sam ran. <laughs> and I don't blame Sam a bit. Sam had a 22 and he turned and he shot the 22 in hopes of scaring the bear. And when Sam reached town, thankfully, the bear wasn't there. But that is not an isolated incident in Northern Ontario. People have to deal with bears all the time. And although we spend, according to the minister, more educating people with bear-wise than any other jurisdiction, no one in the MNR is actually protecting people from nuisance bears. It shouldn't be up to the municipalities. It shouldn't be up to the police because they're not trained to protect against bears. It's up to the MNR, and people shouldn't have to risk their lives doing the things they enjoy in Northern Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Member statements. A member from Etobicoke Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, we have world-class post-secondary institutions in Ontario, and the choice a student makes about their program of study in, in the institution at which they will study is one of the most pivotal and important decisions a person will make in their life. It is one of the largest financial investments we make in our early lives, and the choice of post-secondary study shapes the path we follow in our careers. That is why it is so important that students are able to access the information that they need to make an informed decision about their post-secondary studies. After being elected speaker, I met with student groups, businesses, colleges, universities, and others, and some spoke about the struggles of choosing a post-secondary path. It is not an easy decision to make, and many students and their families sometimes struggle to find the information they need to make an informed decision. Today, I'll be introducing a private member's bill that tasks the Higher Education Quality Council of Ontario with the creation of an online resource that would help students make more informed decisions as they decide on which university or college to attend and which program of study to pursue. The resource would do this by providing a more comprehensive picture for students about access, student experience, and graduate outcomes for each program offered at each of Ontario's post-secondary institutions. I'd like to thank the Canadian Federation of Students, the College Student Alliance, the Ontario Undergraduate Student Alliance, and the Ontario Graduate Student Alliance for their advice in the drafting of this bill and their subsequent endorsement. This bill would have passed help students and families make more informed decisions leading to more satisfied students and stronger outcomes, and I humbly request my fellow members here in the Legislature for their support as it works its way through the House. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Further member statements? The member from Carleton, Mississippi Mills. Mr. Speaker, this year is the 25th anniversary of the Carp Farmers Market. The Carp Farmers Market was founded in 1990 by Hildegard Anderson. She was a farm girl from Saskatchewan who had a vision of a producer-based farmers market in the village of Carp. She found a location, she found the people, she established a board of directors, she found vendors, and the Carp Farmers Market began. 
The main guiding principle that she insisted on was, was that all the vendors be producers of what they sold. In other words, a producer-based farmer's market. That principle has been the guiding light and strength of the market to this day. The carp farmer's market has flourished and today is the most successful producer-based farmer's market in Ontario. Delicious foods and wonderful handmade products are available in, car in carp every Saturday. The number of vendors and customers continues to grow each year. The carp farmer's market celebrated their 25th anniversary on July 4th of this year. Hildegard Anderson died in a car crash in 1993, but her legacy lives on. She would be proud of the carp farmer's market if she were here with us today. Thank you. Thank you. The member from Mississauga, Brampton South. Mr. Speaker, on September 16th, I had the opportunity to attend the community policing dinner hosted by the Miss Saga Chinese Business Association in the Great Riding of Miss Saga, Brampton South. The association advocates for community development through private business and support for local partners, such as Peel Regional Police. At the dinner, the association paid tribute to the local police officer whose career best represents the qualities of community policing. This year, Constable Tom McKay with Peel Regional Police was chosen to receive their prestigious award for his community engagement and years of work in crime prevention. Constable McKay has an impressive resume as a 30-year veteran of Peel Regional Police, an author, lecturer, and a leader in the field of crime prevention. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank Constable McKay for his commitment and also the Miss Saga Chinese Business Association for building a safer, more dynamic, and vibrant community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Further member statements. The member from Barrie. Thank you, Speaker. Imagine this. You're rushing around in the morning. You shout goodbye as your husband, son, or daughter heads out the door to work. Sounds pretty normal. However, that loved one never makes it home or has a horrible accident that changes everyone's life forever. Although workplace deaths and accidents have been reduced considerably, one death is still too many. Over the weekend, I had the honour of speaking at the Threads of Life event on behalf of the Minister of Labour. Threads of Life helped families of workplace tragedy along their journey of healing by providing unique family support programs and services. Threads of Life is supported by a network of volunteers from across Canada who have been personally impacted by workplace tragedy. They assist families by providing a family support program which offers one-on-one -on -one peer support to family members and friends who have suffered from a tragedy such as this. And they are matched with a volunteer family guide. They also give regional family forums, bring families together in a community of support to benefit from coping skills, active listening, and, heal and healing. Speaker, I want to commend Threads of Life for the amazing work that they do for families impacted by these terrible workplace tragedies. Thank you. Thank you. I thank all members for their statements. It's now time for 